Well, welcome to our ninth annual uh, Winter Solstice Poetry Reading, which is a collaboration of Glen Helen Nature Preserve and Council Land Trust. Um, this has been a very different year than uh, what we've experienced in the in the past eight years, but um, we're very excited about uh, working on this again and, and getting a chance to um, try it out in the uh, virtual format uh, because it is such an important year for us to, to get together to celebrate nature, uh, to celebrate the healing power of the earth, as well as poetry. Um, I'm Krista McGaugh, the Executive Director of Tecumseh Land Trust, and uh, I want to give a shout out to our amazing poetry reading team, uh, Ed Davis, who has uh, been creative over so many years and pulling together some just wonderful poets for this for this event. Uh, Matt Berzal and Melissa Batista on our education committee um, are our technical wizards here, and I I think Melissa's kind of behind the scenes. <laughs> I see I see Matthew anyhow, and uh, they they've just been you know so so helpful. Matt has read at these events before and. Um, we, we really appreciate their participation with the Education Committee, Ian Randolph also on the committee uh, and, and one of the poetry reading planners. And um, our staff have all sort of stretched a little bit this year, just trying to figure out how to, to operate in a, in a different way. Um, and so we've got, I think, Lauren on tonight. Jenny's been gathering um, the, the uh, uh, people who've been signing up to get them linked up. And um, we, um, Kathy Polka our office manager has helped a lot as well. And as I understand it, the chat does have the link on, so you can, is that right? You can look at that if, if there's anybody wanted to send the link to tonight, I think, but the chat will be off other, otherwise. And um, Q and A is the place that any participants that wanna have um, questions for the, for the poets. Um, or about the nature of the event are welcome to, to ask questions. Um, this um, is, has been an exciting year for Tecumseh Land Trust and for Glen Helen Nature Preserve in, in many ways um, that um, are, were just you know, un, unanticipated entirely at the end of the year. Um, but it's, it's really been a good year too. Um, I think overall we have become more cognizant of how very important it is to, to get outside and, and to participate in the cycles of the seasons and, and the earth and to celebrate those things with, with art. And um, it turns out that during the course of this year, Glen Helen Nature Preserve actually has changed hands. And uh, so we we're happy to have Bethany Gray with us, who is the president of the Glen Helen um, association, which is, is now the, the owner of the Glen. Um, I want to encourage you, if you're not already uh, a, a donor to the Glen and, and the Land Trust, uh, please consider doing so. Uh, help us with our work. Um, it, it Honestly, we, we are here and we both do our work because we have uh, generous uh, uh, givers to our nonprofits. Uh, who make it possible for us to to provide um, just you know all manner of programming? This among on many, many things, many oppor opportunities, and there's also lots of volunteer opportunities, um, even in COVID. Um, that um, you know we we are constantly uh, looking for uh, folks with new ideas about how to um, how how to bring bring new people into our organizations um, and how to heal the earth. With climate change, I think we're especially aware that um, the, the earth needs heal itself, needs healing. It can heal us. Uh, but I, I look forward to 2021 as a year in which um, I think that we can um, give back uh, and, and help heal the earth. And it's a it's a major solution to the problems that we have in terms of climate, but also um, to our working better as, as a world, as, as a community. So welcome tonight, and I'm happy to introduce Bethany Gray, 
uh, also a board member at the Council Land Trust and the president of the Glen Helen Association. Thanks. Thank you, Krista. Um, thanks everyone for joining us this evening here. Um, we normally would be hosting you in the auditorium of Glen Helen, um, but again, we'll we'll work with this arrangement. And um, I'm privileged to be uh, on both boards of the Glen and the Land Trust. And it's been it has been a year, as as Krista said. And I'm going to take a, a minute or two to just share some more information with you than I normally would because it has been such a unique year and a historic year um, for Glen Helen and its transition. Um, the land trust protects Glen Helen with the conservation easement. So it protects the land from being developed. Um, but the association, of course, manages not only the land, but it manages programs that people have come to, to know and love about the Glen. Um, because we have a broad audience tonight from all over Ohio and, and outside of Ohio, um, there's a, a different uh, spectrum of knowledge about the Glen, so I'll just um, take a few things to highlight for you. Um, anyone that is already a member or donor, I'm going to hold this up. You probably got this in the mail recently, this magazine in the Glen. And I would just recommend that if you haven't got a chance to read that, that's a really good overview of, of everything going on right now, that what we're doing. Um, it was a historic year. Um, Antioch College was looking for a different kind of arrangement for Glen Helen. And we worked, the Glen Helen Association is a longtime friends organization um, founded in 1960. So it's 60 years old this year. And we worked with them to finalize a purchase agreement and we um, uh, finished that agreement in September and took full ownership and management. And um, for those of you that are less familiar with Glen Helen, just a quick synopsis. It is a um, approximately 1100 acre nature preserve. We're the largest and most visited privately owned nature preserve uh, in this region of Ohio. We have approximately 125,000 visitors every year on our hiking trails. Um, we also operate an outdoor education center, which was the first of its kind in the Midwest. And we host um, at least a dozen naturalists every year um, through year long internships. And many of these naturalists you'll probably, you could run into across the country now um, who have jobs in many positions in national parks and so forth. Um, we also operate a raptor rehabilitation center and that is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year of its founding. And we see a number of injured hawks, eagles, um, owls that are brought into the center each year. Um, some of the challenges we took obviously when we took it over this year is we, it, we were in the middle of a pandemic. So we have, we have faced some challenges going into it. Um, and what we've done is that separate from our annual fund appeal, which people get around the holidays, that always helps support basic operations year to year, is we started a campaign to secure the future of Glen Helen. And um, that is a multi-phase campaign, and we will be doing that over a period of months. And some of our challenges we're facing is that five years ago, the Glen had 14 staff. Now it has six full-time and one part-time staff. So we need to build back up some of our human resources. Um, of course, some of our programs got shuttered by COVID and we're still working to reopen those gradually as we're able, um, making plans in 2021 to be as safe as possible. Um, for the campaign, we're not only gonna be setting aside money for our purchase, hiring staff, but we'll also be doing some, some building um, operations as well. So to encourage you, um, because we do um, ask for donations as part of this event, um, our current board members and our past board members of Glen Helen Association have been challenging each other with the campaign. And we set a goal, collective goal of 500,000. And we've not only reached that, we've surpassed it so far. So we're excited and we want to encourage you if you can, um, you know, give a little bit that we all passed and a lot of our past and present board members are, are um, stepping up to, to help and not only the Glen, but to encourage others. And um, 
the last thing I'll just say before I introduce Ed is with some of the campaign funds already, we've started some much needed improvements on our student dormitories of the Outdoor Education Center. We've also um, started much needed improvements on our Mercer Farmhouse, which is one of three residents for our naturalists. And we are looking forward to doing some more improvements on the Outdoor Education Center this, this winter and this spring. With that, thank you for your support. I'll turn it over to Ed Davis, board member of the Land Trust. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you, Krista, and welcome everybody. Um, of course, we miss our cozy building at Glen Helen, but uh, we have extended our reach. I understand we have people watching, listening from Canada and from Australia. So welcome to all you far-flung people. And here we are at our ninth. Um, just a couple of things about the evening's format. Um, we're going to keep introductions very short. I'm going to give you the poets here very soon. Uh, however, if you want to find out more about them, as you no doubt will, you can consult their biographies that are on the Tecumseh Land Trust website. They are extensive, and also they have links to the poets' books, those who have books. So Christmas is coming, and what's, you know, as good as a poet's book? So please consider that. Um, with that, I will get down to business. Uh, the evening's format is that Matt, my co-host, who I'll introduce very shortly, and I will take turns introducing the poets who will inspire and entertain, entertain you for up to eight minutes. We'll go alphabetically. We'll wrap up at the end. And I hope you'll find this evening very inspiring and healing as our theme for this year has stated, the healing earth. All right, I'm very pleased tonight to have Jamie Adolf with us. He's a Yellow Springs resident and the author of several beloved award-winning young adult books. He's also an extremely hardworking teacher right now at McKinney Middle School right here in lovely Yellow Springs. I give you Jamie Adolf. Thank you very much, Ed. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, thanks to everyone um, who's watching and all these wonderful uh, artists that I'm a part of. Um, I just have one poem to read um, today, so I um, can bank the rest of my time for another poet if they would like. So um, I will get started with that. <clears throat> this one is called The Earth Groans. <clears throat> The earth groans under the weight of all that hate and disregard for our fellow human beings. There is no healing when you can't breathe. Seeing is believing as the next shooting plays between commercial breaks, shot in the back, running away, shot while being black every day. It would seem we have become the worst of us, destroying this precious earth for what? Money and greed, who gives a flying frack when the globe is warming? Police give no warnings before they shoot first and never ask questions, pollute first without discretion. There is no healing when you can't breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. This time I would like to introduce my co-host. Matt Birdsall gives so generously of his time and resources as volunteer for the Land Trust, as you heard, but also as editor of Dayton's premier literary magazine, Mock Turtle Zine. He's my buddy too. Matt Birdsall will introduce the next poet. Hey everyone, super glad to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next poet we have coming up is uh, another friend. So Kathy Austin will be reading. Um, Kathy is a Dayton native. In fact, Kathy, Kathy, didn't you live in Yellow Springs at one time as well? And uh, she has a nature, nature infused poetry. Well, I wanted to thank you. And uh, I was had collected poems that speak of nature's healing, but also of nature healing us as well. The first two poems are pandemic poems. And it, uh, the first one is the great stillness. Even the great stillness is not quiet. There are daily disruptions, chirping birds, neighbors chatting on a porch, the perpetual blast of a lawnmower, chimes that wind blows. 
The mind clings to it all, even the annoying repeated blare of turkey in the straw, first verse only, coming from an ice cream truck. There are these waves of normal. Outside, not far, is normal's end, sometimes marked by signs or a line of cars stretching beyond sight for food. But what is worse is the enemy we can never see, only the parade of bodies on TV, the masks and gloves and protective gowns. Some don't believe it, crowd together, party on the beach, protest in the square. The death toll rises without a shot fired. Meanwhile, a bird quietly gathers grass for its nest. An iris slowly unfolds its astro blue in eternal hope. The next one is also a pandemic poem, but it started out as uh, I noticed restrictions as I got older and I didn't like it. And so this poem comes from that. It's called Land Bound. A clap of clouds shook off the barnacles of my mind, and yet now I'm so land bound, finally and forever rooted, like a large tree, grass growing underneath my feet, resident bees buzzing and landing nearby, too familiar, unafraid. But minuscule carrots and kale that I will eat soon rise and grow in the garden like the poetry I've lived on for so many years, each bite tender and rich, like snow-peaked mountain views or the pounding of tropical waves that land so perfectly on the beach. Rosie, who, uh, Rosie Hewart is in the audience, I think. And she's a friend and teacher of mine. Uh, this poem was inspired by a painting that she did. It's called Wild Wind. On this day, wind becomes truly wild, blows in a cover of clouds, suddenly drains the land of color, hides even evidence of shadows. The wind disrespects boundaries, spills its flurries through the fence row, lashes at leaves, whips sticks and stubble into a frenzy, carries unmoored bits of grass and debris, yanks small branches off treetops, swirls it all into an unsorted, glorious jumble, a united wilderness of spirit to settle and begin again. I've always thought of snow as being healing. This one is called drifting. A weak sun glows behind the gauze of winter clouds, spits of snow and shreds of memory. Snow covers leaf curl, the run of footprints across the yard, the persistent unfolding despite oncoming cold. It covers buried squirrel treasures, the latent cocoons. It covers whips of dead grass and wind-torn twigs piled under the tree. It covers the rivulets of yesterday and the final waning note of birdsong with the drifting unity of snowflakes, all different yet all the same. The world drifts for a time toward peace. This poem is bittersweet. Uh, my house had a stink bug problem for a while and I had to stop freaking out every time one landed on me. So I wrote this poem, like the good Buddhist I am, it's called A Time for Compassion. The large dark stink bug appears above you, loudly buzzing, 
performing a spiral death dance that ends in a lock of your hair. His geometric body and marvelous legs clinging gently to soft strands, letting you know you have not been alone. Yet it is not his fault that he chose this place and this time to die, only life as it is, the sudden transformation, his ashen wings stilled. One winter I was feeling down and I felt I just had to hug a tree. So I came to Glen Helen. This is called To the Oak Tree. After living silently all winter, you reawakened my words one day, the day I threw myself at you, that cold gray day, your neon green moss growing greener beneath the slump of late winter snow. The day I whispered I loved you and leaned heavy against you and never asked you to love me in return. And finally, this poem was inspired by another artist friend, Keith Tuey. It's called The Dance. Each day we begin with a prayer which if we are mindful, lasts until night shadows shut our eyes. The prayer contains a blue longing for peace, a quieting of the secret eddies that swirl inside us. It contains the flying stripes of rhythm, a blending of separate to whole, an interplay of sharp feathers and down, of defining shade and scattered light. It contains a whirl of the warm dance the sun traces across the land and the delicious dust of activity that reminds us as we breathe, as we taste it on our tongues, that we are one with it all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Okay, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> well, uh, I have to announce that Mario Cosi is a young man, very talented young man that I mentor in his writing, and he had to cancel tonight due to professional and personal reasons. So that uh, Jamie is alone with the male gender, Matt and I have stepped up and decided to share a poem tonight in the spot that would have been Mario's. So Matt, are you ready to share a poem? Oh boy, here we go. Uh, yeah, so and now for something completely different, but also about healing, right? We're gonna still stay on healing. Um, this one's called Wound Care. My dad specialized in wound care during Vietnam, tending to the broken soldiers shipped back to Annapolis. The ones missing limbs, organs, memories, families. So my relatives all turned to him in dicey situations. Easter day, I was five years old when a neighbor girl came uninvited onto my lawn. She said she wouldn't leave. It was my lawn. I yelled to get off my property. She stuck out her tongue, pushed me. I kicked her shin way too hard. I had on shiny brown penny loafers and the hard toe broke her skin. Instantly, I knew I'd gone too far and when I heard my father's voice behind me, a cold sweat started cooling my eyelids. He screamed something, but I don't remember the words, just the rapid fire rage. I was in a world of shit. We had company, so he pulled me along upstairs inside my bedroom, away from the pink polos, canary pencil skirts, and chilled Pinot Grigio to start really shouting. What the fuck happened? He saw it. I knew that, and I still lied, saying I hadn't kicked her. His hand connected with my lip, and I could taste rust and regret. 
you little liar. When I stopped crying, my father cared for my wound. He was close and I could smell the Benson and Hedges on his face and hands as he tended to the bloody lip, calmly explaining about the place where his ring lacerated the skin and how the scar tissue would form fast, stopping the outside from getting in because the damaged skin was skipping over the long process of making the new skin with its typical cross weave pattern opting for the expediency of scar tissue's parallel structure running alongside the skin's plane. Each fiber aligned purposefully in one direction to protect me from deadly microorganisms and repair the area as quickly as possible. Your lip may never be the same, he said, but it seemed like he was talking to himself, his eyes drifting out of the bedroom window towards a corner of the backyard littered with toy guns. A few weeks ago, when I licked my lower lip, the scar tissue felt more solid, with a little tingling bringing me to this moment of existential parallelism. Because now, I better understand why my father always bounces back so quickly after injuries and insults, and why everyone counts on him. It's his artful bandages and calm presence after a panic. And it's because he made so many temperamental mistakes in the moment, trying to save the young lives who are shot down by a ridiculous war. That scar tissue now insulates his heart. I know now that despite his temper, he'd do anything to protect me, even from things I can't see, but especially from things he has seen. And I realized it was time for me to be honest and apologize for all the times that I lied because I thought we were so different. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I've got a brief poem. And uh, <clears throat> since I have a friend listening in on her birthday, I'm going to send this out to you, Ellen. It's called House of Breath. If you can't hear the silence of these autumn woods, you'll never know it anywhere. So let foot meet ground, lungs swell and release. Weep for love, not for all that falls away endlessly. Live for what remains when all is lost, but abundant breath. Joy is this single green leaf dotted with water among red berries, birds left you to feast on with their eyes, with your eyes. Hoard images for winter when you walk in snow, shrouded, hearts surrounded by embracing cold, the body's breath cage, your hospitable house. Back to you, Matt, for your next introduction. Hey, thank you so much. So I get the pleasure of introducing our current Ohio Poet Laureate, hailing from Albany, Ohio. Carrie, turning it over to you. I know one in particular. I'm never happy to see summer go, earth stripped of its finest voice. I'm sitting outside in my heavy coat porch light off. There is no moon, no ambient distractions. The sky a Zion. I take solace in considering the age of this valley, the way water left its mark on Appalachia long before Peabody sunk a shaft, Chevron augured the shale, or ODOT dynamited roadways through steep rock. I grew up in a house where canned fruit cocktail was considered a treat. My sister and I fought over who got to eat the fake cherries, standouts in the can, though tasting exactly like every other tired piece of fruit floating in the heavy syrup. But it was store-bought, like city folks. And we were too gullible to understand the corruption in the concept, our mother's home canned harvests superior in every way. 
I cringe when I think of how we shamed her. So much here depends upon a green corn stalk, a patched barn roof, weather, the Lord, community. We've rarely been offered a hand that didn't destroy. Inside the house, the light bulb comes on when the refrigerator door is opened. My husband rummages a snack, plops beside me on the porch to wolf it down, turns, plants a kiss, leans back in his chair, says to no one in particular, a person could spend a lifetime under a sky such as this. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, in case you were wondering, I am a ninth generation Appalachian. That's where the twang comes from. And I'm so pleased to be here tonight with our hosts and these amazing poets in honor of the land. My grandparents were uh, the last in a long line of sustaining farmers. They were fiercely connected to the land. They and so many generations before me benefited from its bounty, as do all of us here tonight. And I'm honored to add my voice to the conversation concerning its conservation. This is what's in a name. If my name were an animal, it would be brown dog. Dreaming of squirrels to hound near empty dinner plates, buried bone maps, the certainty of trees. If a spice, it would be fennel, musty after rain, drops swelling the bud point of every bough, a murmuration of starling circling clouds. If a color, the hour before a thunderstorm. A cerulean warbler or stalwart stalks of chicory, jagged petals roiling their tongues in waves. If I were named a spirit, it would be barrel aged. My laughter laced in undertones of honey, fig, and citrus, the burden for truth unfettered. If my name were music, it would be the haruf of a doe, hoof deep in acorns and orange gold leaves. The cicadas calling me home, home, home. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. So I'll leave you with one last poem. Again, I wanna thank Ed and Matt and all the good folks at Tecumseh Land Trust uh, for having me in tonight. Uh, as I have said, Appalachians are taught the magics and power of nat nature and to respect her at a very early age. In our childhoods, we begin to learn uh, these stories. And uh, this is one of mine, one of my childhood stories. It's called Of Mud and Beauty. We was concocters, priestesses of Mommy Moo, devotees of Wadiwa, wearers of bare feet, our crowns, garlands of black-eyed Susan and orange butterfly weed, finger stripes of fresh squished blackberries striped across our freckled faces. Scoopers of loam beside the creek, we conjured our recipe from scratch in a weather-beaten bucket. Flux of yarrow, pink clover blossoms, spiderwebs, toadstools, clumps of lime green moss, a gnarly branch of sassafras to stir the pot. Chanting language known only to the Wadiwa, our harvest transformed into a goopy chunk aroma smelling of rot, herb, and adolescent female sweat. We spread it fearlessly ear to ear as described in Teen Magazine, laid ourselves down beneath white bark pines to cure 
giddy as Miss America contestants, a scrap of fabric crisscrossed round our heads like a swami, like queens of the Nile. We lay still as sticks in the promise of sculpted cheekbones, a fiery afterglow. Until deer flies besieged us, blood sucking party poopers, their stinkometers catching wind of our heady home brew. They wheedled our lips, our nose holes, teensy scissor mouths nipping. Believing they was Hanks sent to hold us back from our rightful lives of glamour, we ran like wild pixies to the fat bottom breast of the creek, baptized our magnificent selves in the name of Money Moo. Thank you so, so much for having me in tonight. I want to I wanna send seasonal blessings out to all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Turn it back over to you, Ed. Thank you so much, Carrie, for joining us tonight. You took me home to Southern West Virginia and uh, I love your lilt. I'm afraid I've lost most of mine, but when I start talking to a person like you, <laughs> it comes back. Thanks for joining us. Well, it is also my great opportunity to take us to our next poet, my former colleague at Sinclair Community College. As a matter of fact, she is the poet laureate at Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Faraha Henry Jones, and also was a member of Dayton's first National Poetry Slam team, Faraha Henry Jones. Hello, everyone. So glad to uh, be here with you. Um, my poems do not specifically relate to nature, but I, I think it's important for you to know this pandemic put me in my house like everyone else this summer. And for the first time I planted a garden um, and it was sunflowers. I planted them to honor my son who passed away uh, two, two years ago. Actually, it wasn't my first garden, my very first and only one before that I planted with my son and it was sunflowers. So having my hands in the dirt this summer um, with all the craziness going on around us, I felt like, um, I'm not healing the earth, the earth was healing me to be able to write the things that I needed to write. So thank you so much. I'm um, going to read a couple of poems and the first one is the only one that I'll give a little bit of introduction to and the rest I'll just kind of flow. Um, I was supposed to write a poem honoring Harriet Tubman and this is what came out. Harriet Tubman, she was one extraordinary woman, warrior, spy, strategist, wrangler of lost souls, freedom fighter, a woman who died, decided to live free or live free. I'm supposed to be talking about Harriet this evening, but my granny, Jewel Marie, she keeps calling my name. She was born in Shope a town that isn't on the map anymore, somewhere in Illinois, round latitude 37 north and longitude 88 west, not too far from the Ohio River. She's been gone for nearly 30 years. And until the last few years, I'd forgotten her voice. But now she's been whispering, talking me through my hard, hard times. My granny, instead of wash and rinse, she says, wash and ranch. Slices are shices. Instead of fast, she says, faced, as in girls stop acting so faced. I hear her again, that voice. And I remember sitting on her porch with brown bags full of long, long green beans, snapping each end and popping them in the middle. Snap, snap, pop, snap, snap, pop. Me and Granny and my cousin Kimmy, sometimes snap, snap, popping in the daylight, sometimes snap, snap, popping under the stars. I should be talking about Harriet, but 
the one and only time I smelled chitlins cooking was at my granny's house. They made her home smell like an outhouse and I did not like it, but Aunt Zelma Ruth had come all the way from Indianapolis to Minnesota and she wanted some chitlins. So granny cleaned them and boiled them for what seemed like all day and did whatever else was necessary. I don't know, I was playing outside to avoid the smell. Till finally, Aunt Zelma Ruth had her chitlins. But I'm supposed to be talking about Harriet. Harriet, Harriet, she was one extraordinary woman. But granny, granny, she's been talking to me, guiding me. She was a creator in our, in our family. Born in the town that's no longer on the map, she was a farm girl. She told me she was responsible for cooking whatever was brought in the house. Pig, rabbit, squirrel, cabbage, carrot, kale. She cooked it for her brothers and sisters, Zelma and Julius and Elba and Addie and Rosalie and Harry and George and Lorena and Laveda. And of course, for her mama and her daddy, Harry and Annie. To this day, we talk about those foods she cooked, cabbage and sausage, pineapple upside down cake, pound cake, coconut cake, peach cobbler. Ain't Zoma Ruth had wanted peach cobbler that day too. And she got it. I should be talking about Harriet, but granny, but my granny, she was one extraordinary woman. Mama's been obsessed with death for as long as I can remember. She tells me everything I need to know after she is dead is in the Bible. And she doesn't mean that in some Jesus loves me this I know sense. The oversized Bible in the cardboard box out in the garage is a file folder. The birth certificates are there, the insurance policies are there, marriage licenses. Mama, Mama wants to know who her daddy was. She tells me to wait until she's dead to ask questions. I'm afraid she'll die never knowing the answer. She's always talking about when I die as if it's gonna happen in the next 10 minutes or so. It used to be depressing. Now I say the same thing. It's 2 a.m. The only sound is the tick, tick, tick of the wall clock with a bullseye background and bloody weapons protruding from the surface. A diamond shaped dagger, a blood lace hatchet, a tainted ninja star, and of course the obligatory dart. Naturally, it's bloodstained too. I turned 50 this year. I was born on a Wednesday. 1,577,923,200 seconds ago. And when I die, I want you to calculate how many seconds I lived. Every single one, count them. Even the times I was sitting on the toilet and reading a magazine. There are a few seconds that you should multiply by 10 to the 10th power. Like the moments my children emerged from the waters of my womb and each one snatched their first breaths. Or the moment after my son breathed in his very last. I hope the sum is an even number, so you can divide them equally among the congregation. The quadratics of life are so much more complicated than the kindergarten calculations I'm capable of. So I need you, I need you to do the accounting, make a valuation of each moment I lived. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you very much, Raha. And now I'll turn it over to Matt for our next introduction. All right, we're moving right along. So this is this is going great. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to a poet from Eastern Ohio. 
Um, all of the all of your work, Robin, that I've read has been nature infused. So uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be more of that. Um, turn it over to you, Robin. All right. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the Tecumseh Land Trust and the Glen Helen and Ed and Matt for inviting me. And wow, the poetry is just wonderful so far this evening. Um, I'm so honored to be among you. I'm going to do, my first two poems are going to be from a book that I co-authored with haiku poet Holly Rainwater called uh, The Curve of Her Arm. And it's based on our kind of inspired by our practice of Qigong and Tai Chi. Uh, but these particular two poems have to do with healing. I'm going to read Holly's first haiku and then my poem. String of pearls rolling up one vertebra at a time. Gathering chi from heaven and earth. She lies with eyes closed, the warm planks infusing relief to her violated muscles. There's a soft thud on the dock, a cold wet nose on her cheek. The neighbor's retriever, first to welcome her back, offers a frisbee. She laughs, flings the disc along the shadows in a familiar game they've played before. The movement pulls her stitches and steals her breath. A loon calls a warning startled at the splash. She touches her fingertips to the water, the uneven contours of her body hidden in the ripples of her reflection. Here she can begin again to feel whole. Others have their lords, their Bethesda. She has this lake, her own healing waters. Again, I will, thank you. I will read uh, Holly's haiku and then my poem. Morning doves, women open and close their arms. Dove spreads its wings. More souls left this earth by violence today. The wailing wall weeps, drowning tiny prayers shoved in its cracks, petitions of the devout and desperate. Mullahs chant sorrowful litanies while funerals fill streets in Jerusalem, Gaza, Syria, ancient places, ancient laments. Where are the doves of peace? Where is the light illuminating the darkness of hate? Can it be found in this room of ordinary people half world away, their arms trying to gather energy, trying to believe in the healing power of light? trying to awaken the peace within themselves? What if there were hundreds, thousands of rooms of ordinary people opening their heart spaces, burning with healing light? Would this release the doves? Would peace take wings? Tell me, what is lost in trying? This next one, thank you. Um, I know some of uh, the uh, the poets I know were super productive in 2020, and some of us not so much like me, um, but I did come up with this. It's called Mantra 2020. And um, what's kind of fun about this poem is um, a local art center, the Pomerine here in Coshocton County, uh, got uh, poems from local poets here in our county, and they are display going to display them around town along with some artwork that a uh, Spanish exchange student is doing. And the fun thing about my mantra is it's going to be on a line of tractor trailers <laughs> and, and, and a road coming into town. So I thought that was kind of fun. It's called Mantra 2020. Stay safe, stay well, stay six feet apart, but stay connected. Put your hand to the screen and touch me. Stay engaged, make good trouble. Stay informed, bless the true sayers. Stay optimistic, stay smart, stay whole. Stay sane, stay sane, stay sane. Stay alive. Stay alive for all that's holy, my beloved. Stay alive, stay loved, stay safe. And my last poem, 
Thank you. My last poem is nature, Matt. <laughs> um, this one is uh, an older poem of mine. Um, a lot of my uh, poems are about nature because we live on 80 acres of woods. And so I see a lot of nature. Um, this one's called Gray Squirrel. As day fades to night, I peer through my reflection in the kitchen window at fluorescent snow and imagine you settled in the shelter of your leafy dray, tail curled around nose. Is the acorn you discovered this afternoon in the lee of the aspen enough to allow sleep your belly barely appeased? My hands immersed in the zen of hot soapy water, I wash dishes from a hearty meal, thankful that I have never been that hungry, that cold. But gratitude, however sincere, is an exercise in human philosophy. You, woodland Buddha, lie in the swaying boughs, no thought of gratitude or lack, sleeping the sleep of the enlightened. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Well, I expected to both laugh and cry tonight, and you folks have me crying. But you know, just like there's good trouble, there's good crying too. So bless you for it. Well, the next poet is my friend Francis Simon, who is a Yellow Springs resident, who uh, is um, in a prominent elite poetry group here in town that others oh. can only, you know, be envious of joining someday. And <laughs> she likes to use her spiritual life to rechannel her spiritual life in her work. Here is my friend, Fran Simon. Thanks, Ben. Is it okay? I didn't realize until this evening that the poems that I chose actually have a theme in terms of healing what I see as the major rift, and, and that is that we actually believe in other rather than the interconnectedness of all of us and everything. Remembering, in the beginning, I was breathed. I breathed. My breath was pure and sweet. My eyes saw everything for the very first time. I was without judgment or guile. The moon rose full, round, bright. I was showered with moonbeams, cloaked in its silvery gold light. I was naked and fearless, beautiful and strong. My body was firm, soft and resilient. I ran with antelope, flew with eagles, swam with salmon. I heard the love songs of whales and dolphins. My laughter was the sound of water over rocks. I drank nectar from flowers and ate rare fruits. I wove blossoms in my hair. I painted my body with juices from wild berries. I found a sacred grove in which to rest, to be replenished. I lay down with the tigress at night and was warm. My skin was covered with light down, soft as a young hair. My eyes were clear and bright. Stars danced in them. I wept for the sweetness and joy of life itself. Every night I died and buried yesterday. Every morning, I birthed myself again. I sat atop a tree and communed with the heavens. I listened when the divine spoke. I was one with everything. I am one with everything. I am breathing. I am being breathed. Deep winter, <laughs> deepening snows of winter, blanketing every surface, 
drawing me to my center, sleeping, dreaming, visioning, remembering who I am, remembering who I'll become. Deepening snows of winter, silencing all distraction, hibernating, regenerating, pulsing to instinctual rhythms, guiding me into spring, rebirthing will soon follow. Every Thursday morning, I climb into my car, drive north, leaving my daughter, son-in-law and granddaughter, so young her breath is still sweet. I drive to a place where disease and dying are the order of the day and no one's breath is sweet anymore. The air laden with antiseptic urine and death clings to my clothes and nostrils even after I leave. Why do I continue to do this? Everyone is sick and death their only exit. Every bond made will sooner rather than later be severed and my heart is broken weakly. I go to them to learn how to face my own mortality, to learn non-attachment, to be of service. I go to them to learn how to live, to learn how to live and breathe even though my heart is breaking, especially when my heart is breaking. I go to them to learn how to live in the midst of dying, as true for me as it is for each of them, though seemingly less apparent for me. I go to them to learn how to remain open in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, fear, hopelessness, of anger, grief, sorrow, theirs and mine. What I give in return seems so small, a smile, a glass of water, fresh flowers by the bed, perhaps a back rub or a walk in the garden, holding a hand, sitting by the bedside doing nothing. Yet it is in these moments of doing nothing where everything happens, where the boundaries disappear, where there's no separation between their out-breath and my in-breath. We breathe together, we are being breathed together. And it is the seamless beingness that I long for, that I sense must be the truth of living, which is why I climb into my car and drive north every Thursday morning. These next pieces are little poemlets. <laughs> um, the form I took from a person named Brian Andreas, who is an artist and a painter and a workshop leader. And it's as if he has asked the question, what people need. When I die, she said, I'm coming back as a large evergreen. I'll stand tall and be vibrantly green all year round. Evergreens know that people need to see something that has constancy and endurance. When I die, she said, I'm coming back as a light breeze. I'll carry beautiful fragrances in little moisture packets and disperse them to everyone I meet. Gentle, fragrant breezes know everyone needs to be touched by the sweet breath of God. When I die, she said, I'm coming back as a magpie 
I'll jump and fly and talk and flash my iridescent tail feathers in the sun. Magpies know people need to be reminded to play. When I die, she said, I'm coming back as water tumbling over rocks, singing songs to anyone who will listen. Water tumbling over rocks knows everyone needs to hear the music of the spheres. When I die, she said, I'm coming back as a bright red orange flower growing up through a rocky crevasse. I'll wave at people as they hike by so they can see beauty on the trek. Flowers growing through cracks. No people need to see thriving with beauty and grace in harsh places. When I die, she said, I'm coming back as thunder and lightning with loud crashing and banging and bright flashing. Thunder and lightning storms know People need to see and feel the wonder, the magnificent, and the awesome nature of life itself. And this poem is called Solstice. It's an acrostic, which means you take the le each letter of the word and write it uh, perpendicularly rather than horizontally. Solstice. Slowly, silently descending into the dark mother, our faith and senses guide us. Light disappears completely, shortest day, longest night. Together, we sleep and dream, intertwined, content now in hibernation. We will soon emerge renewed, refreshed, reborn into the light. And I'm going to deviate just a skosh from what we're doing. I'm giving my time to Wendell Berry to read some of his words because I wish I had written them. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the gray heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran. Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks for adding Wendell's words to your own beautiful ones. Could not leave them out. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people here will join me in saying Wendell has the vibe. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt. Okay. We're going to round it all out. I get the pleasure of introducing our final reader this evening. Hailing from Finley, Ohio, Ms. Carrie Troutman. It's all yours. Thank you. This has been so lovely. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, most of my poems tonight are sort of a winter theme. Um, this first one is called Cardinal. Quaking in the shock of another early December, the tree bones basket themselves skyward, gathering meager sunlight to ration over upcoming months. I pity those exposed frames, brittle, as if a lighting cardinal would crush them to twiggy shatters and fly away, a bewildered blood against the clouds. And I am eager, warmed and fleshy behind frosted glass for the starkness outside to again beget the green tassel leafing of, ah, uh, April. Surprised each time, like how we heave then cleave ourselves parallel again after sex, breathing our heat, unbelieving still that that is how we got our children. 
fearing that the next cardinal to overwinter, repeatedly careening its nothing body against our window's reflected sky will dash, not itself, but our glass to bits. And this is sort of a Facebook poem. This is called December Pruning. Poor canes, I am sorry, I said, clipping blackened rose, rose bush stems, December wind ripping at my eye corners, running nostrils, the hollow canes dropping from my iced gloves to the crusted grass. The night before, in flannel pajamas, my online face glowing with the screen, my back lit by the Douglas firs, tiny lights, a friend from years ago, from what feels like a generation because my children came between, a friend who knew a previous me found this one. In the morning, grim and clouded, I rifled in the cold garage for pruners, stiff from lack of oil, gloves under a sprinkler frozen together, my boots entangled in coiled water hoses. I pulled my wool scarf tight and headed for the roses. I'm sorry, I muttered, snipping. Sorry for not clipping in October. Sorry to the leaves crumbling to frosty dust in my palms. Sorry for not mulching your base or fertilizing one more feed, one more deep water. I'm sorry for letting you grow, if you will, as you will. During a too early November snowfall, my husband's toes point upward from the footrest of his lazy boy as he watches a documentary of the history of recorded sound, music, voice, caveman to digitized. On screen, a scientist chants eerie melodies in the caves of Lascaux, its famed paintings scratched onto the most acoustically ideal areas of the rock hollows. My father used to fill slow Sundays with PBS documentaries. I imagine him daubing our day's stories onto rock walls with mud and blood while songs reverberate through the belly of the cave, the singer man pausing to hack the fire's ash from his lungs. From the darkness of the cave's vulnerable mouth, we hear rumbles of approaching storms, hoping they will not lash in to us. Firelight flickers umber paintings of others who sheltered here, desperately layering story upon story on dry walls. Paula Lambert, if you're out there listening, this one is for you. This is called Saving. I saved one rose worth of petals from my grandmother's funeral arrangement, dried them between sheets of wax paper pressed in an atlas aging dim red like scabs, they seemed something to be saved, but also best forgotten. I could tuck them in the flannel lining of a sleeping bag, toss in restless sleep beneath her UP's aurora borealis, or slip them in my glove box, smuggle them across the rainbow bridge to Canada, toss them out the window into raging horseshoe falls, let them make their own luck. I could crush and brew them into tea, dip dye my baptism dress, wring the excess into a thermos, spike it with brandy for a walk in her winter pine woods at dawn. There would be cold, cold air there. There would be the whisper of starlight through needles. I'm gonna move to my newest book here. This is called Roasting Turkey for Friends. Drippings crackle brown in the roasting pan and the house is gauzed with rosemary smoke. The beast's neck and gizzards poach in celery, sage and an onion's outermost white cloak. Outside, January bombasts itself against the windows and kowtowing shrubs. As a girl, I would wake Thanksgiving late morning at my grandparents' quiet house to the same sizzle, bake, and boil to the oiled mechanisms of seasonal feast. The small bathroom with its ever-closed door, the only room in the house left unsmoked and cool with fogged window and sweet soap, like stepping into a cardinal's startled heart. And then I'll end with 
a poem about traveling because I miss traveling. We, as we all I'm sure do these days, um, being stuck at home. This is called To the Fellow Airport Travelers. I scan your faces, determining which are the weary headed home to familiar sheets, which are the exuberant outbounders hopscotching themselves away from everyday encumbrances. We soar to deliberate towns with books for the interim, tiny bottles of lotion, boarding passes. We pull behind us garments we have chosen for the presentation of our bodies to foreign places. This is who I am beneath new skies, out from under the roofs of the typical. We'll get there someday. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. Ed, I'll turn it over to you for the final remarks. All right. Well, it's been wonderful. I, I'm sitting here feeling I can make it to spring or to summer when we might have some hope of the cloud lifting and life returning travel. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for devoting your, your time to us tonight and giving so selflessly and generously. May I make a comment, Ed? I'd like to make a comment if I can. Yes, who's speaking? Fran. Yes, Fran. That, that even though this is a little odd that we're in our own houses or somewhere speaking, you know, into a screen with a little green light, being so close to each person as they, mm, as they read their work was extraordinarily intimate to be able to see the creases and the faces and the, the different things come up from inside through their eyes. I have to say that this experience has turned out to be much deeper and intense than I had anticipated. And I'm kind of grateful for it. <laughs> Pandemic be damned. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Those are good penultimate words. Pandemic <laughs> be damned. I'll only add, set your calendars for December 10th, 2021, okay. when we plan to do this again, hopefully live and in person because that's the way we love it. Mm -hmm. However, who knows You know what will happen. And uh, we do like that we were able to extend our reach and get you folks from Australia. Canada, Florida, wherever. So we hope you have beautiful holidays, meaningful holidays despite pandemic. And we hope to see you next year. This has been, this has just been super fun and it was wonderful to see you know here's such a diverse group of poets. Everybody brought something completely new and wonderful to the table. So yeah, thanks Ed for inviting me to be the co-host. Thanks everybody. Good night everybody. Happy holidays. <laughs>